I have a word for you. Heavenly Father, we need your love tonight. We need your touch. Not a guilt trip for anybody, not anything but your mercy and your grace. Lord, I desperately need your touch tonight. I feel that there are so many like me that are hurting tonight, perhaps going through one of the greatest trials in their life, and yet I dare to preach in that hurt tonight because of the sheltering of the blood of Jesus Christ and the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, there are people that have come tonight in that hurt. That bear, they bear that hurt tonight. Father, minister to me. Minister through me. Minister to all of us tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. A message tonight, the Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy keeper. There's a thrilling story in the Old Testament that I've always enjoyed. And it best illustrates my message tonight about what it means to be kept by the power of God. It's found in 2 Kings, the 6th chapter. Then Hadad, the king of Syria, had declared war on Israel, if you remember. And he came against Israel and camped with a mighty army. Don't turn to your Bibles because I'm going to be throwing scripture at you and you won't begin to keep up. Just take it, take my word, it's in the Bible. The Lord is thy keeper. Then Hadad, this king of Syria, comes against Israel, camped with a great army, and he calls a war council and he plans a strategy, and everywhere he turns, he's thwarted because the prophet Elijah is sending a uh, messenger to the king of Israel saying, don't go there because Ben-Hadad and his army is waiting for you. He'd send another messenger, don't go there, he's waiting for you. And Ben-Hadad became furious and he called a council. He said "I to all of his servants, show me who my traitor is. Tell me who's revealing our plans to the king of Israel. And the servant said, it's not what you think, my lord, O king. There is no traitor in thy camp or in the court. We are all true men. But this man of God, Elisha, telleth the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedchamber. He was furious, and he sends his most prized group, chariots and an army of men, and infantry, infantry men to Dothan, and he says, get the man and bring him back to me. And in the middle of the night, they surround Dothan, and the servant of Elisha goes out in the morning and he looks in the face of a ferocious army standing there, chariots and horsemen and infantrymen, all against one little prophet of God, Elisha, who'd been ratting on the king. In terror, the servant runs back, Alas, my master, what shall we do? We're surrounded. And with a gentle wink in his eye and a smile on his face, the prophet bows his head and said, Fear not, son, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. No wonder he was so contented. He knew the Lord was his keeper. He could say, I will not be afraid for ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Though a host and camp around against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this I'll be confident. He keeps me. He hath delivered my soul in peace from the battle that was against me, for there were many with me. Now that's my prayer tonight, and that's what I hope this message accomplishes that the Lord would open our eyes, that we could see the mountains around this field with the horses and chariots of divine fire and the Lord of hosts being with us. Hallelujah. Now the Old Testament saints knew the Lord in a way I don't think we New Testament saints know anything about. They knew him as the Lord of hosts. I found 200 references in the Old Testament to this phrase, the Lord of hosts. It was said of David, David waxed greater and greater, for the Lord of hosts was with him. The Lord of hosts, the scripture said, is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. O Lord God of hosts, who is strong, a strong tower like unto thee, or to thy faithfulness round about thee? You find these majestic words all through the Old Testament. Lord God of hosts, hear our prayers. 
Lord God of hosts, he is the one who is with us. Lord God of hosts, he is the king of glory. Lord God of hosts, liveth and will save us. Two hundred times, Lord of hosts, Lord of hosts. And I've read it and read it and read it and didn't have the slightest idea what it meant. Host in Hebrew is Sabawa. It is a very, very expressive word, which means an army ready and poised for battle, soldiers, horses, and chariots ready to go to war at any appointed time, an army assembled and mustered in full array, waiting for instructions to attack. Can you picture this prophet of God knowing the Lord of Sabaah? And I don't think we know Lord Sabaah in our generation today. We don't know anything about him. And I want to share this with you because I don't think you can catch a glimpse of the glory of what it means to be kept by the power of God until you understand what the Hebrew and Greek meanings of these precious words are. And I want to share it with you the best I know how. See, to Elisha, he, the Lord of hosts had become the Lord of Sabaah, the Lord who comes to his assistance with an army poised for battle, an army of multiplied thousands of soldiers and horses and chariots assembled and just waiting for instructions to protect him and to attack the enemy. King Hezekiah, at another time and place when the Assyrians came, knew the Lord Sebaah. The Syrians had surrounded Israel, and suddenly his eyes were opened to this great Lord of hosts, this Lord of armies, in other words. And Hezekiah gathered Israel and all of his soldiers, and he says, be strong and courageous, and do not be afraid nor dismayed for the king of Assyria, nor for the multitude that's with him. For there be more with us than with him. With him is the arm of the flesh, and with us is the Lord our God to help us and fight our battles. And the people rested on those words. Oh, that we could get those words and rest on them. The Lord of Allah. The Lord of hosts, the Lord of an army. David said the chariots of God are 20,000, 20, and that's multiples of 20,000. 20,000 upon 20,000 upon 20,000, that's the original meaning, 20s of thousands. The chariots of God are 20s of thousands, and even thousands of angels, and the Lord is among them. The psalmist said, the Lord is thy keeper. And then Peter brings it out even clearer. He said, we are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, I see this as a prophetic word. And I believe this is prophetic. That in the last day before Jesus comes, he's going to reveal to his people who are hurting what it means to be protected by the Lord of hosts. And when you listen to the news about the Middle East, and you look around you and see how many people are hurting, if you and I do not get a revelation of who our God is, His might and His power, and rest on that, you and I can't make it. If you can't run with a horseman, what are you going to do when the flood comes? Christ prayed to the Father. Oh, I love the 17th chapter of John. I think it's one of the greatest chapters in all the Scripture. It reveals the heart of Jesus and the loving heart of God. He said, while I was with them, he's praying to the Father, and Jesus said, while I was with them, Father, I kept them in the world. I kept them in thy name. Those that thou hast given to me, I have kept, and none of them is lost. Now, you and I have the idea, I think, that the disciples were superhuman saints that were kept by the strength of their own will. And just by the close proximity to Jesus and the power of his word that they were kept and they didn't make mistakes and they didn't hurt like you and I hurt. And these 12 men were such great men of God. No, they were not kept by their own power. Peter had in him a heart that would deny. After three years, after three years with him, Peter stands in the court and says, I don't know him. And he wasn't lying. He didn't know him. He'd spent all that time with Christ and never did know his heart. He wasn't lying. Peter never did know the Lord. These men were frail. These men hurt. These men had 
You know because when Christ was taken, they all forsook him and fled the scripture said, they all left him. No, Jesus kept him. He said, I kept him. They didn't keep themselves. Father, while I was with them, I kept them. And then, looking down through history, thinking of us, Jesus prayed these, these beautiful words and how they blessed my heart. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. He's talking about you and me. I pray not that you take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. That thou shouldest keep them from the evil. I want to show you tonight the best I know how what it means to be kept by the power of God through faith. Kept in English means to retain possession of, to take into one's charge, to provide all the necessities for life, to raise and to feed, to protect and guard, to preserve, to hold in control. But the Greek word used here in First Peter, the fifth verse, first chapter and fifth verse, this word kept is one of the most expressive Greek words in the New Testament. It's polero. And I started studying this word and I couldn't believe it at first, so I kept digging into it. It got better the deeper I got. And it so blessed me, it's changed my life, and it's been such an encouragement to me what the Lord has permitted me to go through recently. You know what the word kept means in the original Greek used here? We are kept by the power of God through faith. It means to establish a military outpost. And to guard that outpost, protect it with a garrison of soldiers, to establish this fortress with a full military line and a full military apparatus, and to set up a sentinel that can see the enemy in all directions, and to call forth the army when it's needed. It's all in that one Greek word, kept, for narrow. And you understand that when the scripture says, he is our mighty fortress. It's not just that he is the fortress. When you have faith in him, he establishes in you a military outpost against the devil. We become an armed camp. You don't believe that, do you? We actually become a strong military outpost with armies of soldiers and horses and chariots ready for combat, and a sentinel. You know, the Bible says we're not ignorant of his devices. Why? Because we have a sentinel. We're kept. So I've never did take time to find out the devices of the devil. That's the, my captain's job. And by the way, since when did the shepherd send the sheep to fight the lion? A lot of you sheep running out, you, you tell them the, you tell them the shepherd, let me at them. I get them. No, you're just a sheep. You run between the shepherd's leg. He's got the staff in his hands. I don't worry much about the devil because he can't find me. My life is hid with Christ and God. Now, if you're a carnal Christian, you watch out. But if you're sheltered by the blood of Jesus Christ and under the blood, and I will tell you something, when the blood sheltered the children of Israel, the Lord said, when I see the blood, I will not, I'll pass over you. And God wouldn't pass the bloodline. He's sure not going to let the devil pass it. Jesus prayed, keep them from the evil. And there's another beautiful Greek word, forero. And it means deliverance from the effect or influence of anything that's bad or evil, grievous, harmful, lewd, malicious, or wicked. And then, finally, the word also means deliverance from the devil himself and everything he represents that's corrupt. Now, let's put it all together and see if you can build some faith on this. We are, you know, the Bible, it, it looks like that we're just kept by the power of God through faith. That's rather just a simple little phrase, isn't it? It's, oh, if we could only see the depth of it. We are God's military outpost protected by a full and equipped spiritual army, including innumerable soldiers and horses and fiery chariots and full battle array, completely informed of every plan and device of the devil, and completely defended in all directions against Satan and all the evil powers of the universe. 
So say amen. amen. Now you'll know what the Bible says. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. What is there in you? An army. <laughs> the Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, and my high tower. You're a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. We do not keep ourselves from evil. We don't do battle with the devil ourselves. The Lord of hosts must do the keeping. It is he that has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and he is good. He delighteth in his children. I don't let preachers put guilt trips on me anymore. I used to hear evangelists thunder against the judgment seat that I was going to stand there, and somehow works were going to burn, and I would crawl down on my knees and cry. Never again will anyone put me under conviction about the judgment seat. We're all going to appear before the judgment seat. But what does the Bible say? He said he's going to present us faultless before the throne of his glory with exceeding joy. Hallelujah. Exceeding joy. Do you mean to tell me we serve him all our lifetime? He brings joy and glory to our heart. We live a lifetime expecting him to run into his presence and, and just be afraid. No, the judgment seat where he puts his arms around me. We're all going to have works burned. You know what they are? All our legal works in trying to please God and add something to the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what's going to burn. Everybody's going to have works that burn. The Lord's not going to let us go into paradise thinking we had anything to do with it. And all our good works, he's going to say, here, see what you tried to do to add something to the blood? You couldn't do it. I'm going to burn it in front of your eyes so when you come into paradise with me, you had nothing to do. It was my blood, period. None of us go into eternity thinking we had anything to do with it. Glory to God. He sent from above and he took me. And he drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy, for they were too strong for me. You go ahead and try to fight the devil in your own strength. Make God all the promises you want, and God will let you have the biggest despair you ever had in your life. And so instead of having a dozen or fifty little despairs, have one grand despair and get it all over with and start trusting God. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, under him, under him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the throne of his glory with exceeding joy. Now we're kept from the enemy without and from the enemy within. The enemy without is suffering caused by manifold temptations. I want to deal with that first because that's the easy part. But I want to show you something tonight. And the Lord gave me this last night. Wherein ye greatly rejoice. Uh, would everybody repeat those two words? Greatly rejoice. Again, greatly rejoice. About what? Let me read it to you. Though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried by fire, might be found under praise and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now the two key words are heaviness and fiery trial. Heaviness in Greek is lupio, which means grief, sorrow, and trouble. But the reference here in Greek to fiery is sudden lightning. That's the Greek word. Fiery trial is a lightning trial. Sudden, coming without expectation. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for season, if need be, ye were in grief and sorrow because of what has come upon you, that the trial of your faith be more precious than the gold that perish, though it be tried by a sudden bolt of lightning that causes pain. That's what it says. If you can't comprehend it, get your strong concordance and See, it's all there. Lightning. Are you here tonight in a season of grief because somehow you failed God? You gave in to a temptation and you know that you grieved the Lord and it's a manifold temptation. I don't understand 
that in the original Greek that this word temptation actually has to do with sensuality. It has to do with the flesh. And I don't understand how you can greatly rejoice when you're being tested and tried in the flesh. I don't understand that at all. You know, I, I, I have all young people say, uh, you know, preacher, you preach it's not a sin to fall into temptation. Man, I passed that point long ago. I gave in. Well, I want to show you something here tonight. You see, there's some of you here also that are sorrowing because of this sudden lightning trial. But if you don't see it as a test of faith, you're missing something. But it's a test of faith that you come out to face what is coming in the future with a spiritual backbone because if you think this is trial, you see nothing to what is about to happen to this world. If I told you what I think I know in the spirit prophetically about the next few years, you would say, God, test my faith and bring out gold. Can you rejoice in spite of it? Just like the scripture says here, can you rejoice? And can you rise above it by faith and glorify the Lord through it? And, and, and is this whole thing going to end in praise and honor and glory to his name? That's what the scripture says. Now, those who believe that overcoming Christians don't suffer, don't know their Bible, and they don't know God. <laughs> One of my favorite writers is T. Austin Sparks. He's been dead for about 30 years. Great English writer, great man of God. And he made a statement once that shook me at first, but then I realized that's what was happening in my life. He said, God will allow a crisis to be created in your life so that you can't get by with information anymore. But you have to have revelation. You can't just have sermons preached at you anymore. You've got to know him. And God will let that crisis come back and roll it in and roll it in until death comes to the flesh. Until there's nothing left but Jesus. There's nothing left but him and the cross. We don't have the preaching of the cross from our pulpits anymore. We're preaching everything but the cross of Jesus Christ. I'm asking him to bring me back to that place. Jesus Christ was sinless. Yet the scripture said he suffered. And he suffered as an example. Now I tell you in love, I've had people walk out on me. Three months ago, I had a whole contingent of people walk out because I was talking about Christian suffering. Indignantly, pants out. And I felt so sorry for them. Because when it comes and rolls in on them, they're not going to be prepared. For even here unto ye are called. Now why don't we see that? Here's what we're called to. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. Now that's not David Wilkerson version of the Bible. It's King James. Here's what you're called to. Because even as Christ suffered for us, he's left us an example that we should also follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was any deceit found in his mouth. He had no sin, there was no deceit in him, yet he suffered. There are many preachers who do not preach this message. You hear preachers and evangelists today standing in the pulpit saying, here's what you are called to, saints of God. Here's what you're to follow in the way of example of Jesus Christ through suffering. And it's not usually a result of sin. So I've suffered most when I've been closest to him. It's not the enemy without that is the battle. It's the enemy we're in that causes most distress. David said, in my distress I cried. I could stop right there and preach a sermon. I wonder how many of you could stand up and preach a five minute sermon right now. In my distress I cried. In my distress I cried. But you see what David was crying about. Here's a holy, godly, holy man. A man after God's own heart. And he looks inside of himself and he cries out to be delivered from himself. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. 
And if out of the, the if the mouth speaks from the heart, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, then David is saying, deliver me from my deceitful heart. He looks inside and he sees deceit. He has a heart that burns for God, but in his flesh he sees his weakness and he cries out, oh God, deliver me, deliver me. And then he looks inside and he says, what shall be done unto the earth? What do you deserve, O deceitful heart? What is God going to have to do to you, David? Thou false tongue, sharp arrows of the mighty and coals of Jupiter. Woe is me, David cried. He sees the sinfulness in his heart. And in those days, arrows were synonymous with judgment. And the coals of Jupiter represented the wrath of God. And he said, I'm supposed to be a child of God. But he said, I see something in me that frightens me. I look at my flesh and I'm afraid. And he says, I deserve, from what I see in me, I deserve nothing but these arrows of God being shot at me. And he started looking around to see where the first arrow would hit him. It's what you and I do, don't we, when we sin. Where is God going to strike us down? Is it going to be a child that gets sick? Is it going to be my husband, my wife? Am I going to get cancer? We look for the arrows and the calls of Jupiter. And I don't believe you can understand grace until you understand the deceitfulness of your heart. You've got to understand that if you had, if you got from God, if you and I got what we truly deserve, it would be nothing but the sharp arrows and the coals of Jupiter. You and I deserve the wrath of God because of what we are. You tell me you're not under law or right, go into the New Testament. There are 250 laws in the New Testament. You can't keep one of them. Have you loved your neighbors yourself? Have you loved God with all your heart and mind, soul, and strength? Then you broke the law. And if you break the law, you're deserving of hell. You're good for the cause of Jupiter and the arrows of God. And we all tremble at the thought of it. And if you looked at it long enough and that, that, if that's where you stopped, you'd have a nervous breakdown. You could never understand who God was. You could never understand grace. You cannot understand or comprehend the loving Father. You can't comprehend grace until first, as Paul said, you see the exceeding sinfulness of sin. And this is what God was doing with David, showing him his heart, showing him, him the lying tongue in him, showing him the deceitfulness. Can you tell me anything more painful for a, a man of God or a woman of God than to preach or to sing or to witness and to say I'm a man or woman of God and then go home and cry at what you see in your heart? Can you tell me that isn't the most painful thing for a Christian? Galatians mentions 17 sins of the flesh, not one of them having anything to do with demon activity. It includes adultery and witchcraft, and it doesn't even mention a demon. So I do believe that carnal Christians can be harassed by demons. But I'm going to tell you something. You're not going to cast those 17 sins out by having somebody pray with you. You're going to deal with that flesh through the power of the Holy Spirit. There's flesh involved. There's flesh involved. Woe is me. And finally, he comes down, oh God, is your mercy and grace gone forever? And all he wanted was to feel the mercy and grace of God. And finally, he came to the end of himself. He came to a place of resignation. Up to this time, his eyes had been cast down. He'd been introspective and looking into his own hearts. And I'll tell you, the only time he got the victory, the only way you and I can get the victory is to do what David did. These eyes that were looking inward, these eyes that were looking at the flesh, began to look up outside of himself. And he said, then I will lift up mine eyes under the hills. Now what does he see in the hills? What did I tell you? It was in the hills. And the Lord of hosts. Sabah was there with his army. No wonder he's looking there. It's the only, he should have been looking there a long time ago. If you get your eyes off your pain and yourself and your hurt and start seeing who he is. 
I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. I'm looking to the hills from whence cometh my army is what he's saying. My help cometh from the Lord. He will not allow my foot to slip. He that keepeth me will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is my keeper. You can't keep yourself. Oh, God, open our eyes that by faith alone from the hills come our salvation to him alone who can keep us from falling. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve my soul. The Lord shall preserve thee from all what? You listening to me? From all evil? And here you have been fighting that evil thing all by yourself. He will keep me from all evil. A better translation is he will hedge me about with thorns to keep the enemy out. David's faith in God's forgiveness. Oh, David suddenly just felt the glory of God's keeping power. And David finally said, this isn't my battle anymore. This is not my battle. I resign. I'm not going out there with my tin sword anymore. It's, it's really, if you really look at it, David talked about having just a, a, a toothpick in his hand. And he put away his toothpick. And that's about some of you. Are you going out pricking the devil with your little toothpick? And that's about all you're doing. When you've got an army and the hills surrounding you, if you just lift up your eyes and by faith appropriate it. Now I want to show you something. I found something here that if you'll catch this now, can be one of the greatest words of encouragement you've ever heard. Because it has been for me. I've never seen it before. I was laying in bed the other night, and oh, it just flooded in on me. David, in the next verse, said, The Lord shall preserve my going out and my coming in from this time and forevermore. Now, do you get anything out of that? The Lord is going to preserve my going out and my, my goings out and my comings in. Now, going out here is synonymous with failure and giving in to temptation and sorrow. Now the prodigal son had a going out. And didn't the father keep him in love while he had a going out? And he also had a coming in and he was preserved then too. We're always going out. We're going out of his love. We're going out of his holiness. We're going out of his presence. We're going out into our own will. But he says, I'm going to keep you even in your goings out. You say, oh brother Dave, I'm already out. I, I, I've gone out. He didn't keep me. Oh, yes, he did. You look back at that time that you gave in and you indulged. You did that thing that you hated. And you didn't seem to have the power and dominion over sin and you indulged. And you said the Lord didn't protect me. Take a look. Go back and see how miserable you were. Because the Holy Ghost wouldn't let you enjoy it because he was protecting and preserving you. And you felt his love and you felt his presence and he you felt his arms around you and the kiss on your neck and he brought you back. Don't tell me he didn't preserve you. Oh, there are a host and host of Christians all over America and around the world that have gone out on the Lord. David thought he'd gone so far. He said, and that's what he said, I, I'm gone so far, Lord, that I'm lost. I'm a lost sheep. Seek me. Find me. I've gone so far out, I'm lost. I've always believed that the most important move you ever make is the move you make right after you go out and fail. It's when the devil comes in and says you're dirty, you're filthy, you're no good, and you lie and cheat because his desire is to hide you from the love and the grace and mercy of the Lord and his forgiving love. And he wants you just to stay down and say, I can't get back. And like David, I've gone so far, I'm lost. And you just sit there hurting. You come to the house of God like you are tonight. And you say, all oh, deep in my heart, I love him. I still feel his presence. But I've, I've just slipped. And I, I, because I don't have power over sin, I can't go on because I don't want to be a hypocrite. I don't want to live a lie. I don't want to be a phony. 
And yet sitting here, you know, you sense his love. You sense that he still is reaching to you. And above and beyond it all, if you just come back. You know, when the prodigal son came back, his father was waiting without a question. Not a question. Didn't blame him for spending his substance and wasting his life. He'd been there yearning after this child that had had a going out. And he preserved that love for that boy just like God has preserved his love for you no matter what you've done. And that prodigal son is drawn by that love. I don't think it's just because he came to the end of himself. I think it's because he felt the drawing power of his father's love. And the moment his father sees him, he runs out after him, throws his arm around him and falls on him and kisses him on the neck. No questions asked. Perfect, undeserved grace. And he says, take the rags off his back. Put the robe on him. Put shoes on him. Put a ring on his finger. And he takes him to the door of the house because you see the father doesn't want to just kiss you. He wants to take you into the banqueting table and feast with you. You can interpret the whole Bible that way. That you and I have a tendency to be the prodigal. To go away from his mercy and grace. And God's desire is to bring us into a heavenly place. Seated with Christ Jesus at a feast of good things. And the Lord always has a problem. How he's going to get us into the house. And not just in the house. But at the table feeding on the lamb. But see, you and I are so used to looking at the blood. I was telling our brother uh, about this uh, a little while ago. You picture two Israelites in Egypt. The night of the Passover. And the blood's been applied to the door. And the Lord says, I'm going to keep to the night. When I see the blood, I'll pass over you. And here's a house. They've sprinkled the blood on the doorpost and the lentil. And this particular house, dad is so nervous and mother is nervous. And they look at their firstborn. And the father takes him in his hands and says, family, please pray. We may have failed God. And all night long they live in doubt and fear and misery. They may have hurt God and grieved him. And the next door, they're sitting there in peace and joy and happy. Sheltered by the blood. And the firstborn looks at the father and says, Are we safe? Am I going to die tonight, father? And he said, Oh no, son, you're safe. The blood's on the door. But not only the blood, we've got the father's word. Which of those two houses was safest that night? Which one? Where they were doubting and afraid? Or where there was faith and joy? Which house was safest? They were both safe. Because they were both under the blood. See, it didn't matter what... In fact, they were they were packing idols in their satchels that night. Forty days later, they're going to be dancing around an idol, a, a, a golden calf. In fact, Isaiah said, when God found you, you were harlots. You were prostitutes, but God had a favor to you. That's grace. They were, there was nothing in those people that deserved deliverance. That's why some of us need... Uh, just as much keeping power when we're coming in. He'll preserve your going out and your coming in. Hallelujah. So it was in one of my going outs recently that it's last week. I I don't like to talk about my personal battles, but how you know how in the world can I relate what I'm talking about unless I get into it a bit. I've just come through probably the worst two months in my life. Unbelievable. I'm on the fifth month of a year sabbatical to seek God. If you'd have told me what it would cost me, I would have never done it. I'd have preferred to go on, just take the plaudits of men and take the offerings and preach to the crowds and go on. Most painful, unbelievable experiences. Two months ago, everybody in my family got sick. I have a beloved son, 25 years old, who pastors an all-black church in the ghettos of Detroit. I had to bring him home. His white count was dangerously low, very sick. His little child, my grandson, Ashley, just a baby, started bleeding in the bowel. My two daughters got sick. Another grandson, desperately sick. And then on top of all, 
uh, in an effort to cut back, our ministry offered a house for sale. And a man comes in, said he was a multimillionaire, accepted the price, gave us a check for $50,000 down, and said I was a former CIA agent, and I was in narcotics division, and my family's in danger. I'd like to move into the house immediately to safe house them. He used all the terms a CIA agent would use. So I let him move in. He immediately bought $90,000 of the furniture. And some friends of ours who are interior decorators, he wrote out checks for it all. Well, the $50,000 check to me bounced. The $90,000 bounced. And these were friends of ours. And they were in panic. Found out the man was one of the biggest con artists in America. and was dangerous. And for a whole week, I had to hide my family in a motel. Our men had to carry guns. And we had to go in with trucks and take that furniture back to the mart to save the credit of those young ladies. I watched as people came in ready to kill that man. He'd taken homes from people. He was trying to, he was trying to cheat on ministry. And God protected us from that because we are his little turtle doves. And a turtle dove is helpless. We just have to depend on his keeping power. As soon as that was settled, my wife was rushed to the hospital. She's had six operations for cancer. And now they diagnosed her as having lupus. Excruciating pain. And she got out, I think, day before yesterday. And I was at a hotel right near the hospital a few nights ago, laying there, just looking out the window, like so many people who live, you, you live in a state of being stunned. You're just stunned. You love the Lord, but you're stunned. You're overwhelmed. And you have no answers. And I'm, I'm sitting there, and I take my Bible in my hand, and wouldn't you know it falls to Jeremiah. And all I can see is this man coming with robes dripped in blood and wrath against sin and judgment. And then I turned to Isaiah and finally I threw my Bible down on the on the bed and said, Lord, I'm sorry. No wrath tonight. No judgment. I'm hurting. I can't take it. I don't understand. I love you. I don't have any doubts. But the Holy Spirit touched me and I laid back and I said, Lord, I'm just going to let here. I'm going to sit here, lay here for an hour. I'm just going to let you love me. And he loved me and loved me. I started crying and enjoying his love for an hour. He just loved all the hurt out of me. All the hurt was gone. You see, the, the, the Lord is not standing here. He's not wanting to hurt you. He's not trying to judge you. We serve a loving father who delights in his children, who understands what we're going through. But so many times we won't stop and let him love us. Hallelujah. Now, I want to give you a word of caution here, please. For all who suffer. And I'm glad the Lord showed this to me because I needed it. I don't know if some of you are going to understand this or not. I'm going to give you a scripture and show you something I don't think you've seen. But it's vital. It says of Christ, when he was reviled, he reviled not again. And when he suffered, he threatened not. Now, what a tremendous statement. When he suffered, he threatened not. I want to talk to you about threatening God as a result of suffering. And if you're suffering in any way, you've got to hear me now before I conclude this message. You see, not once did he defend himself when people were talking about him. He never mistreated anybody. He never punished anybody. He never retaliated. But how unlike us today, we threaten when we suffer. And when the suffering gets unbearable, we really threaten. We try to defend ourselves. We're constantly protecting our rights and our reputation. We withdraw from those who hurt us and mistreat us. And we hope secretly the Lord will get even with them on our behalf. Now, we won't pray it, but we sure hope it. But worst of all, and here it is, it's a very subtle thing that happens, and I don't know if you've ever seen it, and we're really not aware of it at times, but I want to make you aware of it because I've been doing it and the Lord made me aware of what I've been doing. And I'll never do it again, God helping me. When our prayers seem to go unanswered and the deliverance doesn't seem to come when we need it, 
I, I've known people say, Brother Dave, I've prayed for five years. When? All I want is some evidence that God is answering prayer. Just anything. I'll, I'd like to see some evidence. And when the deliverance doesn't seem to come, or when you you say, Lord, keep me holy and pure, and in spite of all that, you fall into temptation and trouble and disaster, and it seems like the Lord's let us down, and we become very lonely and very empty, and there's a sadness in us. Then we start pulling back on God. We slack up on our prayer and our Bible reading. Or we still love the Lord with all of our hearts, but we let go of the zeal. And it's a subtle way of saying, Lord, I did my best, but you let me down. And when you stop seeking God with intensity, when you suffer, that's threatening God. When he suffered, he threatened not. And I know Christians who have prayed about something in their life. They've had a besetting sin and they've prayed and prayed for deliverance and didn't come. And finally they went and indulged it as if to say, well, I have every right to do it because I prayed and God didn't take it away. It's a threat. It's a threat. I've got a right to do this because God let me down. Are you catching that? I'm not here to scream and yell at you or put a guilt trip on you or wave my hands and try to be active and a powerful preacher tonight. I want to get some word into you that will give you strength. Some truth that will help you in a troubling hour. He suffered not. He, when he suffered, he threatened not. And I know there are times that when I've suffered, I've been so overwhelmed and so stunned, I would pull back on God, and then the Lord showed me something. You see, it's one thing when you're suffering and you're in a boat that's storm tossed, and suddenly Christ appears. See, it's one thing to be in a boat that's tossed, you in a storm, and it looks terrible, but you're laying there, or you're going through life, and suddenly you feel His presence, and then you begin to relax and, and, and sit back. Now, it's one thing to just rest in Him, but you have to be careful. That it's not just passiveness and fatalism. Where you say, well, he's there and you just sit back because that can lead to terrible doubt and fear. But it's another thing in a storm to make a move toward him and get out of the boat and say, I'm in a storm and I'm going to use this storm to get to know him in a new way. Peter wasn't showing off his faith when he got out of the boat. He wasn't trying to belittle those other disciples. But he had something in his heart that was reaching out to his master. He wanted to touch him and see him in a new way. And he wasn't satisfied to say, well, the Lord is near. Thank God the Lord's near. Let's all just rest. And oh, how God's been showing this to me. David, when you're down, when you're hurting. And I, I saw this this past week. Use this as an opportunity to get out of that boat and walk on the water. Take a step of faith. Go toward him. Make a move toward him right now. Love him like you've never loved him. Reach out to him. And even though Peter got his eyes on the storm, the truth is he did walk on the water. He was above his problem for a while. And the, the faith that kept him above the water for six steps could have kept him all the way. You know, when Stephen was being stoned, he looked up and he saw an open heaven. And he saw him who sat on the throne. And from that moment on, he was above it all. Nothing could hurt him. The stones couldn't hurt him. He was already seated his, with Christ in heavenly places. He was already gone. Because he had an open heaven. I don't want anything anymore in my life but Him. I want Him to fill everything and I want, it, I want to know Him as my keeper. The Lord is my keeper. I gave up the struggle a long time ago when I found out how much He loved me in spite of who I am and what I am and what I've done. And I, I feel sorry for people that every time a preacher says he's going through a problem or has had sin in his life, everybody thinks of adultery. That's not my problem in case you want to know. We're all just mud balls. That's all. We all have feet of clay. Hmm.
So I guess I'm finished. <clears throat> but there's some of you who have threatened the Lord. And you, you've lost the sense of his love for you. I, I can tell you that though this has been the worst two months of my life in the physical realm, it's been the most glorious two months in the spiritual realm. Because I've had a vision of grace, a glimpse of his mercy that endures forever. And I don't find him spanking me anymore. I don't, I don't feel his wrath anymore. I feel his love. I feel him kissing me. And you know, here's the prodigal. Isn't this something? The prodigal, the Lord's already, the father's kissed him, put a robe on his back, shoes on his feet. He says, come in the house and this poor, stupid kid, and I'm not being facetious, but that poor little child doesn't understand his father's love at all. Because he's, he's sitting there, he said, I'm not worthy to go in there. You know what he's saying? I need three more months of discipleship. Uh, I, I guess I don't feel grief for my sin like I think I should. I need a little more time to prove to your father that I'm still not in the pig pen. And I got this all out of my heart. No, 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 no. He said, come on in. You know, you can walk right in and God's will for you is to come to the table tonight and be seated at the lamp and partake and be full. I'm full tonight because I feel his tender lips on my neck. And I've got his robe on my back. And I'm sitting at a table. He said we're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus and I believe I'm everything he said I am. You know, some of you people make better Jews than Christians. Because you're living under such legalism. Oh, come on in the house. God not mad at anybody here tonight. Have you failed him? All right. You see how... There's no preacher has to tell you how bad you feel. Huh. I don't want to make you cry. I want to make you rejoice. But you know as well as that, you can feel it right now. There are people here that are hurting. And you're hurting because somewhere you got it in your mind that you've grieved the Lord so bad you don't have a right to his love. And I think that hurts him more than it hurts you. I had my daughter in law, and with this I close, beautiful little Kelly, sit in a chair and she sat on the floor, put her hand on my knee. And she said, Daddy, do you know how much I love you? You're so tender, you're so nice. I said, yeah, Kelly, there's one way you can love me. Accept my love for you. Let me love you, and then I'll know you love me. And we always say, oh, how I love Jesus, but that we won't let him love us. I've been letting him love me all through my preaching. God doesn't want you to go through life focused on your sins. But on Him and His mercy and His grace. Is there anybody that needs some mercy and love and grace tonight? You say, Brother Dave, I felt so empty. I felt so unloved. I'm still here. Let me help love you. Is there, Brother Dave, I felt so cold. I, I just need His love tonight. I want Him to love some hurt out of me. Oh, can't you feel His love? <laughs> Come on, college kids. Dad, Mom. Bring it to him, lay it down here right now. He just wants to love you. You've got to accept it. Lord, your love is so incredible that you could look down in an audience tonight and see us in all of our foolishness and our hurt and say, I delight in you. You're my child. Hallelujah. Are you hurt in your home, your marriage? Are you hurt in your home, in your marriage? Let me minister to you for just a moment. I'd like to just take you by the hand and ask God to let you have a moment of the hurt just draining out of you so you can leave here tonight knowing the Lord Sabawa. When's the last time you ever heard a message on hell?
Now, a great number of ministers don't even believe in hell anymore. Dr. Savage, a theologian, said, I wouldn't care if hell were written on every page of the Bible, I still wouldn't believe it. Now, most Christians believe there's a hell, but they really don't like to think much about it. They get edgy when they hear preaching about it, in fact, because uh, it seems so far away from this life of ease and prosperity we have for us going in America. And even sinners like to think they're going to heaven. They don't even think about hell. And the only reason people can be comfortable in their sin, they remove the thought of hell completely out of their thinking. Shorty, a uh, drug addict about this high, came to me once and said, Mr. Wilson, I dreamed I died and went to heaven. God found out I was a junkie, so he sent me to junkie heaven. He said, and when I got there, he said, I was sitting on a mountain of beautiful white powder, as far, a huge mountain of white heroin. And there were thousands of needles as far as your eye could see. And at the base of this mountain of heroin was an eternal lake of fire and water to cook this stuff with. And all through eternity, I shot heroin in my veins, and the pile never went down. He said, that's heaven. That's where I'm going. He doesn't even think. There's not a drug addict in the streets of New York or anywhere in the country that thinks so. One moment about hell. It's all, I'm going to heaven. One way or another, I'm going to make it. People no longer believe there's any wrath in God. Nowadays, God is all love. He's all sweet, easygoing. He's never going to cause anybody to suffer. He'll ne never let anybody be tormented. And that's because this generation has lost its fear of God. Jeremiah the prophet cried out, You have forsaken the Lord your God because the fear of the Lord is not in you now. Isaiah cried, why are your hearts hardened to the fear of God? You sin because your hearts are hard to the fear of God. The psalmist is even more to the point. He said, sin lurks deep in the hearts of the wicked, forever urging them on to evil deeds. They have no fear of God to hold them back. They have no fear of God to hold them back. Psalm 36, 1. They have no fear of God to keep them back from their sinning. Now let me show you what happens when a generation loses its fear of God. The results are terrifying. Our organization sponsors a program called Youth Research Foundation, coast-to-coast -coast program, and we've just completed a one-year research study program from coast-to-coast, -coast, 42 states. This included young people and uh, college students, teenagers, rich and poor, urban rural, every economic social group, and get ready now to be shocked. Now, folks, a uh, Gallup poll uses 1,200 people. We use 3,000 in every one of our surveys. And if we multiplied it and did 50,000, the results would be the same, the percentages. Now, listen to this. 84% of the young people are drinking, 84%. 52.7 smoke, 52.2 use drugs, 66 percent, two-thirds of all the young people interviewed said they'd rather live together without a marriage license than get married. They just live together, cohabitate. Now here's the shocker. This blows my mind. Of all the kids in 3,000 that we interviewed, coast to coast, 42 states, of all those who confess they're using drugs, sex, alcohol, drinking, and into the occult, 82% claim to be born-again Christians. Now let me read to you, word for word. Here's a 15-year-old boy from Mississippi, uses drugs, smokes, drinks, has anything go sex. I quote him, being born again is the ultimate experience in my life. Christ is my Savior and Lord. 19-year-old girl, from Fort Worth, Texas. Smokes, drinks, uses drugs, anything goes sex. I'm thankful Jesus died for me and saved me from hell. 19-year-old boy from Fort Lauderdale. Smokes, drinks, uses drugs, involved in sex. In fact, he said the most three important things in his life are women, sex, and money. What about Jesus? Jesus saved me from hell. Here's a young homosexual from Fort Lauderdale. 
drinks, uses drugs, homosexuality. Jesus is my very loving Savior. 16-year-old girl from Mississippi, she's into the occult. She smokes, drinks, and uses drugs. Jesus is neat. I wish he were here right now. I'd like to talk to him. 19-year-old girl from South Dakota, smokes, drinks, uses drugs. I attend an Assembly of God church. I speak with tongues. Going to heaven is the most important thing in my whole life. Smokes, drinks, uses drugs. Young boy, young man from Hollywood, Florida, sex, drugs, drinks, smokes. God talks to me every day. I love him dearly. 17-year-old boy from Oklahoma, smokes, drinks, uses drugs, anything goes sex. I can't wait for Jesus to come. I want to meet him. Folks, what's happening in America? After a so-called 10-year outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon all flesh from the youth revivals and then a charismatic renewal, the Bible says they have no fear of God to hold them back. This generation's lost its fear of God. This nation's going mad because people no longer believe there's a payday. 17-year-old boy said, why not live it up? When you die, you just die. You float off into a world of colors and rest and peace. Our young people today are convinced that the judge has gone soft. There's no more sentencing, no more prisons, no more judgment day. Now, they don't say sin pays. They just say it doesn't cost you anything. It doesn't hurt you. Who's responsible for this madness? Who is it that's robbing this generation of the fear of God? Who is it that's taking them down the road to hell? I accuse here and now the backslidden, unbelieving preachers of the gospel, those who've lost their faith, but who still continue to preach the gospel behind the sacred desk. Now, folks, listen, I'm not, I haven't even started yet. I want... I may never get invited back here, but I'm going to load my guns good right now. Let me, hold it just a minute. I, I am not one of those evangelists who goes around spanking preachers. They get enough from their deacon boards. I, I don't believe in that. And we've got some godly preachers in this place. There are a lot of godly ministers in this town, great men of God. But there are a lot of reprobated wolves in sheep clothing in this town and every town. And these preachers who've lost their faith are sending more kids to hell than all the drug pushers and com pornographers combined. Jeremiah the prophet was heartbroken over the false preachers of his time. He said, My heart within me is broken because of these men. My bones shake. I stagger like a drunken man. I've seen in the prophets of Jerusalem a horrible thing. These men commit adultery. They walk in their own lies. And they strengthen the hands of the evildoers. So sinners will not stop their wickedness. They are unto me as Sodom and Gomorrah. These backslidden priests and prophets of Jerusalem had encouraged people in their sins. Why? Because there was sin in their own heart. You show me a preacher who stands up and winks at sin. He's trying to excuse something in his own life. Jeremiah scathed them with his holy anger. Thus saith the Lord, hearken not to the words of these prophets. They make you proud. They don't speak for the Lord. They speak out of their own hearts. Jeremiah was saying, wicked preachers produce wicked parishioners. Wicked preachers produce wicked people. Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart. They cause my people to forget my name. They steal their messages from each other. I've not sent these prophets. I've not spoken to them, yet they continue to preach. Jeremiah 23, 21 to 27. Come on, folks. What's behind all this? Not the pushers, not the pornographers, not the massage parlors, not dirty television. They are encouraged by godless preachers. They say unto them that despise me, Don't worry, all is well. And to those who live any way they want to, Be at peace, no evil shall come upon you. Isn't that what people want to hear now? Isn't that why they flock to hear preachers of happiness messages? 
and simple positive preaching. Just be at peace. Just think what? There's no hell. Everything's okay. In other words, do what you please. Live it up. Have fun. God is good. Don't worry about hell. You can have happiness. Live as you please. Now, how can you tell whether a man behind the pulpit is a man of God or a man of the devil? What's the test of a false prophet and a true man of God? A true man of God has the fear of the Lord in him, and he turns people away from their sins. Do you believe that? Test him. Is he preaching a gospel designed to turn men's hearts away from sin? Listen to the Bible. If they were mine, saith the Lord, they would try to turn my people away from their evil ways. Jeremiah 23, 22. If they were mine, if they were my preachers, saith the Lord, they would try to turn my people away from their evil ways. There's the test. A true man of God doesn't use lightness in the pulpit. He's not a joker who can laugh when people are dying and going to hell. Jeremiah said of them, they caused my people to err by their lies and by their lightness. Their lightness. They have nothing at all to say to my people. You show me a Bob Hope in the pulpit, and I'll show you a man who's damning people to hell. A preacher who preaches nothing but comedy and happiness has never turned anybody away from their sin. Thank God the Holy Spirit's raising up holy men all over the country. I see this now happening. More and more ministers are weeping between the porch and the altar. More and more men are laying down their golf clubs. More, I'm not against that either. But folks, when the world is dying and going to hell, we have got to have men who come in Sunday morning, having been half the night if necessary on their knees, and come into the pulpit Sunday morning and say, Thus saith the Lord, and the whole audience knows it. You can hardly find a church anymore. Oh, thank God there are some. You can hardly find a church anymore where you can sense the power of conviction, where men are convicted of their sin rather than lulled to sleep in their iniquity. But even in evangelical circles now, too many ministers are growing cold. They're compromising and they're actually encouraging people in their sin. I wrote a book, for example, called Sipping Saints. I struck out at people who think they can talk in tongues and drink scotch and speak in pickled tongues. I don't believe in that. Now, I have a charismatic experience. Now, I don't like the word charismatic. It sounds almost like asthmatic or something, like a disease. But I, I have this experience, and it's, it's a beautiful devotional experience with me. But I want to tell you something, folks. If you're going to boast that you have given your tongue to be baptized the Holy Ghost, you better not be soaking it and smoking it. I, 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 wrote, a, I wrote a book called Sipping Saints. You know who wrote me the most criticizing letters? One, ten pages of criticism? Preachers! I got more bad press, more bad letters from preachers than all the prisoners combined. Brother Dave is a legalistic, uh, fundamentalist do-gooder. Stick to drugs. Well, what do you think that is? That's not a liquid pot anyhow. Who's leading the parade now in America to accept homosexuals? Who is it? Who is it that suggests homosexuals should be proud of what they are? Who is it that says, let's ordain them? Preachers. Ministers. Who is it that's flying now to the Arab lands and hugging Yasser Arafat, the killer of Jews? Who is it? Preachers. My brother, sister, these are wolves in sheep's clothing. They don't know their Bible.
I believe there's going to be a reserve section in hell for the faithless, evil-minded ministers who have helped damn this generation. Don't tell me how hot hell's going to be for rapists and homosexuals and alcoholics and drug addicts. It's going to be far more hot for those who have led people astray. You think of Hitler killing all those Jews, but then you think of a minister standing in the pulpit and can never condemning people to their sins, standing up there, lulling people to sleep, playing the flute while they're floating their way to hell. There's a reserve section. Better a millstone were hung around his neck and cast into hell than that he should offend one of these little ones. Now, I hear a lot of you parents out there saying, Amen, Brother Dave, give it to those preachers. Well, I got something for you. <laughs> parents are just as guilty as backslidden preachers for sending this generation to hell. Have you ever heard parents say, our kids went wrong when they took the prayers out of the schools. Our schools are too soft. They don't discipline our kids. They get away with murder now. They have no respect. The teachers are at fault. My kid went bad, but I've got three other good kids who just had a rotten apple in the barrel, that's all. This one was a bad, basically bad kid. He was led away by his evil friends. His friends did it. The school did it. Listen to what the Bible says. Prepare slaughter for the children because of the iniquity of their fathers. Why this slaughter? Because of the iniquity of their fathers. Isaiah 14, 21. Why are young people being destroyed by drugs and alcohol and sex? Because of the iniquities of their dads and their mothers. Children of the ungodly are always worse than their parents. Your fathers have forsaken me, Jeremiah said, and have not kept my law, speaking for God, but you, speaking to the children, but you have done worse than your fathers, each of you walking after the imagination of your own heart, and you will not listen to me now. You're doing worse than your fathers. When God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses, he said, Speak to the people these words, For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, bringing down the sins of the fathers unto the children all the way to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. But I'll show mercy to the thousands who love me. But I will bring the sins of the fathers down on their children to the third and the fourth generation. Folks, right now, we are facing the godlessness of two generations gone by. We are paying the price right now. Jesus taught that the wicked children are simply carrying out the tradition of their fathers, a tradition of wickedness, snakes, sons of vipers, not vipers, sons of vipers. How shall you escape the damnation of hell, you sons of wicked men? You're following in your father's steps. You fill up the measure of their wicked ways. You're filling up the measure. Know how Jesus pinpoints our problems today. Your kids are finishing what your parents started. Cursing, drinking, cheating, adulterous parents have caused this wave in America of immorality. Now, the preachers and the false prophets encourage the kids in their sin, but dad and mom start them in it. I think I know what torment wicked parents are going to face in hell. They're going to have to have an eternity They're facing those kids in that same hell, tormenting and hounding them all through eternity. Now, this generation's resisting the Holy Ghost. They're getting hard-hearted because their parents taught them disrespect for the things of God. Stephen cried out, you stiff-necked and hard of heart, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. Because your fathers did, so do you. Your fathers resisted the Holy Ghost, so do you. You follow right in your father's footsteps. In fact, Stephen was killed by a mob of children. A mob of children. Now, they were adults, but they were the children of people who resisted the Holy One, the Scripture says. And you resist God just like your fathers did. He said that to the crowd that was stoning him. 
You resist God just like your fathers did. You're just like your dad. You're just like your mother. Folks, you think about what's happening to our young people in America today. I shudder. I get a chill down my spine when I think what's going to happen 10 years from now if Jesus tarries. I shudder to think what's going to happen when we pay for 50% of the marriages ending in divorce now. 10 million kids living in broken homes right now. Folks, what, what's going to happen when we have 74% of the adult population drinking now and hanging out at all of these uh, happiness hours now from 4 to 6 o'clock with, with their girlfriends? And all the cheating, and all the fornicating, and all the cursing, and all the Christ denying. What happens ten years down the road now if the children are worse than their parents? If it's this bad now, what's happening ten years from now? Parents who were prayerless, addicted to television, cheating, scrambling for success, wallowing in materialism, forgetting God forsaking the house of God, burdened down with depression and fear, drinking and cursing and self-centered. Is that why Jesus said there's going to be a falling away? Now, there's one more enemy that's dragging this generation down the road to hell. One more enemy. At first, when I was praying over this message, I was going to say, wicked companions, evil friends, preachers that are ungodly, parents that are wicked, and friends that are wicked. After all, isn't that what you hear around the country now? Isn't that what you hear from sinners? In fact, for years I've been preaching, stay away from the crowd. Don't let your friends drag you down. I'm not going to preach that tonight. I'm not preaching that anymore at all. I'll never preach that again in my life because the Lord showed me something. The crowd doesn't make anybody bad. Your friends don't mess you up. Your friends don't turn you on to drugs. They don't turn you on to drink. Not at all. You were rebelling against God before you ever moved in with that crowd. They didn't put the desire to sin in you. You got that all on your own. The crowd just brought out of you what was already in you. They just helped you be yourself. That's all. I had a teenager come to me and said, Brother Dean, you don't know. You're from a different generation. You don't know how hard it is to stay away from the crowd nowadays. I said, Honey, you don't know your Bible at all. You don't stay away from the crowd. The Bible said, you let your light shine for Jesus, and they'll do the job for you. They will separate you from their company. You don't have to fight the crowd. Everybody, all these uh, secret-believing young people, scared to uh, take a stand for Christ. You know what I believe? I don't believe in secret beliefs. I believe young people that have enough Jesus in the say, Make room of Christians coming down the hall. You yourself must first become an enemy to God before, before you can become a friend of the world. First thing, an enemy to God, then a friend of the world. He that is a friend to the world is an enemy to God. How does it start? An enemy to God makes you a friend of the world. Ungodly friends, all ungodly friends have one thing in common. They have all turned away from the gospel. They've all rejected Jesus. Now, that's illustrated clearly in the Bible between the friendship of Herod and Pilate. Now, here were two leaders, two government men, who weren't even talking to each other. They were bitter enemies. But suddenly, they find themselves with one thing in common, the man Jesus, Herod and his soldiers mocked Jesus. They ridiculed him. Then they dressed him in a gorgeous royal robe, sent him back to Pilate's hall. And listen to this. And that same day, Pilate and Herod were made friends, for before that they were angry with each other. 
What made Pilate and Herod, these two wicked men, friends? They had one thing in common. They were both lined up on the opposite side of Jesus. Their mutual rejection of the claims of Christ made them friends. Pilate needed Herod now, and Herod needed Pilate, because they both knew he was the Son of God. They had heard him teach. They knew that they should fall down and worship him. They knew it, but they rejected him, backed off. Now, Herod knew in his heart he was wrong. Pilate knew it, but he heard that Pilate turned him down. Herod heard that uh, Pilate heard that Herod had turned him down, and they got together and comforted each other in their rejection. What made them friends? Their mutual rejection of Jesus Christ. And the only way you can be in the crowd, the only way is to have rejected all the claims of Jesus before you ever got there. If you've got eyes of lust, you'll run around with an adulterating crowd. Adulterers. You'll run around with kids who lay around in the back of vans, making out and going all the way in sex at drive-in theaters. You don't go out and somebody takes advantage of you. Don't believe that. You have that in your heart, and your friends mirror what's in your own heart. Your friends aren't dragging you down. You're dragging down as many as they are. You're in it just as deep as they are. They didn't make you sin. They didn't drag you down. No more talking to me about how the gang dropped me down. I wasn't going to do it, but they forced me. I did what everybody's doing. Everybody going to party, so I go to party. Everybody's smoking pot, so I smoke pot. No, you drink not because you're trying to be sociable. You drink because you like the taste. You like it just like the rest of the crowd. You're with the party crowd because you're a party person. Did you hear that? Let me run that by slow. You're a party goer because you're a party person, that's all. I can tell what you are by the friends you run with. You tell me that, like these kids, I can drink. I can smoke, I can curse, I can have sex, I can use drugs and still be a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's not what my Bible says, buddy. It says, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in the world at the same time. And my friends, the day is coming soon that I believe the next move of the Holy Ghost is going to be a clean-up campaign in the house of God. And all these Hollywood celebrities that are in a Jesus club one night and a Hollywood or a Las Vegas club the next night are going to be purged. If they're sincere, they're going to fall on their knees, even if it costs them their reputation and their jobs and their money and their houses and their lands. I was taught when you come to Christ, you gave up the world. I wish I didn't scream so loud, but I get the feeling it's so strong. The path ends in hell. Now, no one simply dies. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Now, folks, I'm going to share with you tonight my concept of hell. I didn't get it from a book. I want the Holy Spirit to make hell so vivid tonight, nobody in this building will ever forget it. First of all, let me say that hell was not made for people. The Bible said hell was prepared for the devil and his angels, and that's all. God said he wasn't willing that any should perish and die and go to hell. Not one person. In fact, you can't get to hell until you claw your way there. You have to fight through the Holy Ghost, the Word of God, preaching like this, and all your praying friends. You have to want hell awful bad to get it. Hell was not made for people. And that's why some of these theologians say, how can you reconcile a hell where people are tormented with the love of God? How can God torment people through an eternity? 
Well, folks, they don't understand that God didn't make hell for people. He made it for the devil and his angels. Now, hell is the furthest point you can reach away from God's presence. So when people tell me that hell may be in the pit of the earth, I have problems with that. Now, I don't know where it is. It could be what I call a furnace planet. If it's a furnace of fire, it could be a furnace planet because already we know that some of the planets are on fire. It's very easy to see the Lord said outer darkness. There's a passage that leads to hell called outer darkness. It's the end of this passage. You know what the devil represents? The furthest point away from God that a soul can reach. Here is God. The furthest you can get from God at the end of that outer darkness is Satan himself. That's hell. Now, God could have easily created a planet called hell and flung it to the outer reaches of the dark universe and reserved it for the hour of the damned. I don't know. But I've often wondered in my study of the Scripture why at the great white throne judgment the angel of the Lord binds the sinner hands and feet just before they're cast into darkness, into outer darkness. The angel of the Lord shall bind them hand and foot and cast them into outer darkness. I said, Lord, why? Why are they bound up? Isn't it enough they're going to hell? Why bound? Now I know it for the same reason that some unscrupulous businessmen went into the heart of Africa and brought blacks into America and put them on the auction block, bound hand and foot, and sold as what? Slaves. Slaves. All the devil slaves are bound by chains, and God even delivered the fallen angels to hell in chains. God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them in chains to darkness to be reserved unto judgment. He delivered the angels in chains. There is no freedom in hell. They are bound because that signifies to God, I am delivering you, your slave. This is your property. This is your slave. I delivered him bound to you. You bound him. Here he is, bound. Every sinner is going to be delivered to hell, delivered as a slave, bound in chains. God's chains. And the devil can't loose those chains. In fact, the devil's going to be bound for a thousand years himself by the angel of God. Here it is very clearly in the Scripture. They are going to be bound hand and foot. I don't have that scripture with me, but there's a scripture in the Bible that says the angel of the Lord will go take Satan and throw him in the pit and bind him hand and foot for a thousand years. Now, hell is described in the Bible like this, a bottomless pit, a lake of fire, a furnace of fire, a place of torment, a place where sinners weep and wail and gnash their teeth. Now, is there really literally a lake of fire like hot lava that spews out of a volcano? Is there really brimstone in hell? Or is the fire of hell something supernatural, a kind of fire that our minds can't even comprehend, something millions of times hotter? First of all, folks, I wish you would get out of your mind Dante's Inferno and the concept of hell as being some place where there's just uh, the fire, the kind of fire we picture coming out of a furnace. Do you know uh, men in China and India have learned to walk on white hot coals? Uh, fire, there's a law of nature that where there's fire, there's light, and there's nothing but darkness in hell. Nothing but darkness. It's dark. If you're thinking of a physical kind of fire, the kind you're not, you and I know as natural fire, you can forget that, folks, because there's a fire far, million times, millions of times hotter than that. I want to talk to you about a fire in the bosom of man. Let me read it to you. Can a man take fire in his own bosom without getting burnt? Proverbs 6, 27. Psalms 39, 3. My heart was hot within me while I was musing. The fire in me burned. I lie even among them that are set on fire. Psalms 57, 4. Proverbs 16, 27. An ungodly man diggeth up evil, and in his lip there's a burning fire. For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. The fire is in the heart. It's in the mind. It's in the conscience. Let me read it to you further. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are coals of fire. 
which hath a most white hot flame. What is it? Out of the heart, the spirit of jealousy, the coals are coals of fire, which give out a white hot flame. A white hot flame where? Not down there, not up there, in here. For wickedness burneth as a raging fire. Wickedness burns as a raging fire. The breath of the Lord is like a stream of brimstone. Isaiah 30, 33. The breath of the Lord is like a stream of brimstone. That doesn't mean that there's actual ash falling. No, he's trying to show something more powerful than that. It's like the hot lava of God's breath. I tell you that I believe that hell is ignited here on earth. Every sinner ignites the spark of hell before he ever gets there. Behold, all ye who kindle a fire that surround yourself with sparks, walk in the light of your fire and in the sparks that you've ignited, but you shall lay down in sorrow. When you lay down in wickedness, the fire is a spark that you ignited by your own wickedness. God looked down on the wicked and he said, These wicked are smoke in my nostrils. They are as a fire that burneth all the day long. God looks down right now and he sees the fires of hell burning. He sees it burning in the hearts and minds of men everywhere right now in this auditorium. Jesus said, The fire is in the tongue even. The tongue, James said this, The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. It defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. Did you hear that? James said the fire of hell is in your heart and comes out your tongue. What you speak, your confession, that you've denied the Son of God, your wickedness. God's not sending you to hell. You're sending yourself to hell. You're walking in it right now. He that believeth not is already damned. Jesus warned that hell is a place where the worm never dies and the fire never goes out or unquenchable. Now, what does that mean? What is the worm that never dies? Folks, the worm is the memory. It's the conscience. The torment of hell is the constant replay of every lost opportunity. Even the devil and the beast and the false prophet are going to be tormented by this worm. And the devil was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Even the devil's going to be tormented. The lake of fire. Folks, have you ever wondered what the Bible means? A lake of fire? Abraham was promised a seed like the sands of the sea. The sea. Jude said the wicked are raging waves of the sea or the lake, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. You know what that is? That's a sea of damned humanity. That's a sea. That's a lake of lost people. That's a lake that's burning. There's a fire inside of each one of them. It's a lake of fire. The seed of Abraham was as the sea. The prophet here, Jude, says they're raging waves of the sea. You see, that's hell. These raging waves. This lake of raging people with the fire burning in their bosom. What did Abraham say to the rich man who called out of hell to him? Abraham said to him, Son, remember that you in your lifetime received good things and Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and now you are tormented. All right. What was the torment Abraham is describing? Remember. Remember all that you had. Remember your lost opportunities. Remember you had plenty of chances, and Lazarus didn't. What was the torment Abraham is describing? Your remembrance. I call it instant replay. Now, folks, I want to get heart to heart with you now. I hear people say, well, I believe that, David, all the hell you get the hell on earth right here. I'm in hell. Have you ever heard anybody say, I'm in hell? No, you haven't been to hell until you stand 
before the great white throne of Christ. Jesus is the judge, not the Father. The Father judges no man, but has given all the judgment to the Son. Jesus Christ is the judge. You've not been to hell until the book is open. And I know what's in that book. I used to think it'd go like this. Well, you committed adultery on January 15th, April the 7th. You cursed God's name uh, 55 times. Here you cheated your income tax and all the ugly, filthy deeds of the flesh. That's not what's in the book, folks. The book's going to be open and you're going to be judged. It's going to be something like this. January the 7th, you were watching television. You heard an evangelist, Jimmy Robinson, Billy Graham. You turned it down. On this day, you went to church with your wife or family. You turned me down here. This day, you were driving to work, feeling depressed. The Holy Spirit was sent to you, said you need Christ. You rejected it. You rejected your friend's call here, 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 here. And all the opportunities, all the opportunities you've had, those, you see, the only sin that really damns you, the real damning sin, is your rejection of the love of Jesus Christ. I can't bring myself to believe that God is just concerned about uh, whether you uh, smoke or drink. Those things are damnable, yes. But the thing that sends you to hell is the fact that Jesus stretched out his arms and loved you and called you and called you. He said, I called you and I called you and I called you. You said, no, here, no, here, no, here. You kept saying no to me. You haven't been to hell till you face that. And before you go to hell bound hand and foot, the Holy Ghost is going to implant those opportunities so strong in your mind. That's when the fire begins. Never dies. That's the worm that doesn't die. That worm is going to turn. You haven't been to hell until you're bound hand and foot and face that gapping hole called the abyss called outer darkness. You haven't been to hell till you drift further and further and further away from the presence of God. Until finally face to face with the devil. The Antichrist on one side and the beast on the other. And he clays, lays claim to your soul. Now folks, let me tell you what I believe it's going to be like. I, I don't believe, first of all, that God gets any pleasure out of the death of the wicked. The Bible said he gets no pleasure out of the death of the wicked. Some people think that God's going to stand on a, sit on the throne all through eternity getting glee. And getting a thrill out of people uh, tormented through hell. Oh, no, no, no. People are going to be tormented because of the memory of the love of God. The love of Jesus Christ and all the lost opportunities. It's going to, it saddens the heart of God. It grieves Him. God's not against any sinner. His love reaches out. And I'm preaching hell, but I'm preaching it to you in love. That's just what Jesus wants. But folks, here's what I believe it's like. Here's a husband from Fort Worth, Texas. A husband that's here tonight, no doubt. He's going to walk out on me because he's going to say some other time, I felt nothing. He's hardened his heart. He's heard Billy Graham. He's heard James Robinson. He's heard Rex Humbard. He's heard them all. Man, he's been saturated with the gospel. He's had time after time. His wife's talked to him. His friends have talked to him. He's going to walk out on me tonight. But one of these days, my brother... You're going to stand face to face with the devil. And you're going to be in hell. And I don't look for you to be in some kind of hot lava with a stench of flesh. No, that's not hot enough. I'm going to tell you about a fire that terrifies my soul. I hate to even talk about it. It's so frightening, even to my heart. As many times as I've talked about him. He's in hell. He sees Satan. All the dregs of humanity, all the perversions, all the filth, all the ugliness of the damned. He stands there and said, oh, I'm lost. I'm lost, I'm damned, I'm in hell. And suddenly the worm begins to turn. I called instant replay. He's feeling the agony of being damned. He's feeling the agony. I'm lost. I'm doomed forever. There was a hell after all. And suddenly the worm turns in his conscience. And suddenly the fire begins to burn. And suddenly in his mind the lights go on. And he's back in this auditorium. And he's sitting right in his same seat. And he looks around. And Mr. Wilkinson's right on stage. Everything's in its place. The lights are on. And he breathes a sigh of release. He pinches himself. He said, oh, my, I don't know what happened. Somebody must have slipped something into something. I drank. I've had a nightmare. I must have had one of those out-of-the-body experiences. I dreamed that I stood before Christ, and I was in hell. I saw the face of the devil. 
Oh, thank God. Lord, you don't have to tell me anymore. You don't ever have to call me again. And I'm preaching the same sermon. He can't wait now for me to quit. He said, Mr. Wilson, please give that invitation. And he fills the pool. And he gets up and he walks down now and he's running now. He, yes, Jesus, I'm coming. I'm coming. I've had a dream. I've been scared this time. The fear of the Lord's the beginning of wisdom, and I'm coming right now. He comes down. He stands there. He's surrounded by people, the same people who came that night that he rejected. They're all there. He said, oh, I must have dreamed it. I'm still with the crowd of believers. I've made my decision. Jesus, here I am. He's about to feel the flood of peace come into his heart. He's about to feel the, the warmth of the Holy Spirit, and suddenly the picture goes black. It's gone. He wakes up and he says, it wasn't a dream. It wasn't a nightmare. I'm in hell. Suddenly the worm turns. And all around him people are going through it. Screaming, gnashing their teeth. This waging waves, this lake of fire that's burning in the hearts of men. They're all remembering. They're cursing God. Don't allow it anymore. Not enough cursing his face. And suddenly the lights go on again. And here he is in his living room now. His wife is there bringing in a cup of coffee. And the little boy is playing with his truck. And Billy Graham's on one of his specials. And he says, honey, come here quick. I think I'm losing my mind. I keep floating in and out of the body. I thought I was in hell. I saw the devil. I felt the lostness. I felt the damning of my soul. And he pinched me. Tell me I'm alive. She says, settle down, honey. Everything's all right. See, the fire is burning. This is torment. This is torment. Because now he's back in the flesh. And he said, honey, please... Let's get on our knees right here and now. We've heard him say it so many times. Come on. There is a hell, honey. Come on. Let's pray. And he said, Jesus, come in. I want to be saved. Thank you, Jesus. And it breaks down and it goes black again. So, God, how long do I have to put up with that in and out, back and forth, heaven and hell, life and death? I'm lost. My wife is gone. My child is gone. I'm in hell. Can you imagine? Folks, I tremble. You talk to me about some kind of fire out of a furnace. That doesn't scare me at all. What frightens me, my brother, sister, what puts the almighty fear of God in my heart is that I should go through eternity reliving crusades like this, reliving opportunities and calls, reliving every Bible verse I'd ever heard. And all through eternity have the face of some Christian friend appearing here, here, everywhere, saying, Come on, John, Jesus loves you. Come on, John, get saved. Come on, John, here's the scripture. And all through eternity, he says, Get away, don't. So he reaches out to smash that face with his fist. Get out of my sight. That face keeps coming up all through eternity. Every Christian friend, every Bible verse that rings through his ears and his heart. hell. It shocks me beyond words that we lost our fear of God. I preached the love of Jesus too. I preached it all my life. But folks, we've preached it so much that we've got a pablum God now who has no wrath in him. We have allowed and justified sin and every kind of corruption in our lives. And we picture that when we get to God, he's going to be so loving, he's just going to wipe it all out and let you go scot-free. Now, folks, I don't believe in scaring people to heaven because it doesn't work if you just get scared. And I learned my lesson the hard way. When I, I used to love to preach funerals because I got people scared to start with. And I got more people saved in my funerals than a lot of people did in their crusades. And I, I remember when my wife's grandfather died. He's in his 80s. Grandpa Morgan, great man of God. And he told all of his children, grandchildren, nephews and nieces, 
You'll never get away from the power of my prayers. Even when I'm dead and gone, my prayers will get you. And I knew he'd said that. And they asked me to preach the funeral, and I just got out of Bible school, boy. And my wife's brothers and family, I, I was only 115 pounds, and they used to call me the screeching deacon and skinny and everything. And I thought, boy, I got them now. Those were days of the open casket, and I'm up on stage, and there's Grandpa's body laying there, and I look out, and there's the family. Boy, and I started preaching hellfire and brimstone. They started sliding down in their suits. And I said, boy, they're low enough. I'm going to do it now. And I lowered the boom. I said, now, I've given you an invitation, and you better get up and come and kneel at Grandpa's casket or Grandpa's going to get up right now, point a bony finger in your face, say, come on, right now, I told you wouldn't get away. Pandemonium broke out. Boy, did they come running. They could, they could just see Grandpa getting up saying, come on, David, come on, Ray, come on. I, I mean, they were weeping and wailing, and I stood up there, boy, I'm getting them all saved. The next day, they wouldn't talk to me. They were all mad. Didn't do a thing. I'd scared them. And I said, never again. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to paint what I believe is a vivid picture of hell. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. Now, folks, you and I had better get a hold of God tonight. Some of you people are not living where you should at all. You know it. Some of you have been flirting with sin so long. Some of you have just been so far from the Lord. I'm asking you to open your heart tonight. I'm asking you to say, Jesus, I feel your love. I know you don't want me to be damned. You came to seek me. You came to save me. That's the beautiful thing. Even though there's wrath in God, his love is greater than his wrath. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask you tonight, to be honest before I close. Are you ready? Come on. Is there open, flaunted sin in your life? Are you playing games? Do you keep saying, Lord, you know my heart. One of these days I'm going to come. One of these days I'm coming all the way back. Are you sitting here right now having to admit, David, I've left my first love. I used to have his fire in my soul. Oh, I loved him. The word was real to me. But something's happened to me. I'm drifting away from my first love. God said, I've got something against you because you left your first love. So repent. Remember how it was. Go back and do it all over again. I want tonight to ask you to come back to his arms. Come back to his love tonight. God forbid that you should hear a sermon like this. You should hear a message like this. Then get up and walk out. And say, well, I'll take my chances. I can't imagine anybody doing that. I can't imagine anybody sitting through a meeting like this, hearing the word of God. Now, I gave you a scripture. I didn't preach David Wilkerson. I preached God. I preached Jesus Christ. I preached through the anointing of the Holy Spirit tonight. And I don't think there's any more the Holy Ghost can do tonight. But come down and tug and pull at your heart and say, this message is for you. Flee from the wrath of God. Flee from it. Run from it. Run to the arms of Jesus. You can be protected. He says, come on, I'll take you into my arm as a mother hen gathers the little chicks. Come on, come on, get into the ark of safety. Come on, get under my wing. The storm is coming. The end is coming. All hell is going to be let loose. Come on, get under my wings. It won't touch you. I'm going to keep you. I'm going to protect you. Come on, get in. Folks, you better get in soon because the time is drifting away. Slipping right through our fingers. I want everybody in the building to stand quietly. Not a sound being made, please. Not a sound. All right, look this way.